Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark Schiff from Sightlines. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I really appreciate you giving us an hour of your time. I'm joined today by my colleague, Scott Smith, who is the Vice President and General Manager of Gordian's Enterprise Solutions Business. Uh, he and I will together uh, handle this webinar and then um, entertain questions at the end. In terms of our agenda for today's webinar, I'll just handle some quick logistics uh, in just a moment, and then we'll jump into uh, a membership update. I'll tell you about some of the things that are happening in the Sightlines business. And then I'll transition to a discussion about Gordian. As, as most of you are aware, Gordian and Sightlines joined forces about nine months ago. Lots of really, really good things have happened since then, so I'll provide an update on some of the things that we're pursuing and some of the capabilities that Gordian brings to bear. Uh, I'll then transition over to Scott, and Scott will provide an introduction to Gordian's uh, flagship service, job order contracting. And then, as I said, we will uh, conclude with, with questions and answers. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, simply enter your question in the box that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, we'll compile those questions, they'll go directly to us, and then we'll read them aloud uh, following the presentation and answer as many as we can uh, in the final 15 minutes. Uh, one, one question that we often get that I'll answer right now is, um, this presentation will be made available to you. We will send out all the slides, and there will also be a recorded version of this that we'll post and distribute. Uh, so with logistics covered, let me talk a little bit about what's happening uh, at Sightlines. And I'll start by just talking about our membership growth. Um, our membership continues to grow really nicely. Uh, as our membership grows, our database becomes deeper and we're able to obviously offer greater value to our members because we're providing a richer data set and you're also getting the opportunity uh, to compare against a broader peer group. Um, you can see this is a, a sample of schools that have joined uh, Sightlines membership over the past several months, and it's a really nice mix, uh, geographically diverse, uh, large publics, small privates, really the range, and of course that's what we strive for to keep our, our database representative of the higher education market. Just a couple of months back, uh, we introduced a set of new solutions. Uh, pertaining to sustainability. For those of you who, who know Sightline as well, you know that we already have a sustainability solution that was introduced back in 2007. That service was focused really around satisfying the needs of the American College and University President's climate commitment. Um, we still offer that service today, but we have introduced additional sustainability solutions as the market uh, around sustainability in higher education has evolved. Um, the new service that we are offering, uh, which we are referencing here as our reporting service, is now meant to address uh, what's really been a widespread adoption within higher ed of the ASHI STARS uh, reporting and rating system. We now have the ability to help institutions comply and make this reporting process far easier. In addition to that, we have our planning capabilities that can help the institution to build out their climate action plan and measure progress going forward. We're in a great position to offer these sustainability solutions to the higher education market. We obviously know higher ed incredibly well. Um, our expertise is around managing large sets of data. And then really another important dimension to this is we have great passion in the business around sustainability. We've had a number of people join the organization over the past couple of years where sustainability is, is near and dear to them. And all of those things combined really caused us to put more emphasis around sustainability and we're excited to offer these uh, sets of solutions to you. In addition to growing our product and service set, our organization continues to grow uh, actually quite quickly. Just in the, the first half of this year, we've added 22 people to the Sightlines team. Most of those people are in the member services organization, that's the team that visits your campus, works with you on data collection, and ultimately presents findings back to you. I wanted to highlight one individual uh, who joined recently, 
Uh, and that's Pete Zara. Pete is from uh, Wellesley College. He was most recently the AVP of facilities there. We've known Pete for a really long time. He's been a great client of ours. He also served on our member advisory panel. And when Pete announced that he was leaving Wellesley, uh, we were very quick to pursue discussions with him because we thought he would be a tremendous asset to the team. So we're thr thrilled to have Pete join Sightlines. He started with us just uh, two weeks ago. In terms of Pete's responsibilities, I think it's important for you all to, to know that he is someone that will be very active with you and out in the market. Um, a bit behind the scenes, Pete's going to be working with our member services team to ensure that we're always putting forth the best possible deliverable when we meet with you on campus. But also in certain instances, we're going to ask Pete to really serve as a senior resource who can accompany our team to your campus for those really important, important cabinet level or board level presentations. Uh, and then lastly, we've asked Pete to work across the membership to better facilitate peer-to-peer -peer discussions and making sure that introductions are happening to ensure that our members are always getting access to best practices. We've done that a good bit within the Sightlines business. There are selective, selective liberal arts colleges in the Northeast that we bring together annually. We've brought together schools from the SEC, the Big Ten. We want to be doing more of that um, because we think there are lots of best practices that can be shared with Sightlines acting as a facilitator. Another new uh, uh, dimension to, uh, to things happening at Sightlines, we've heard this from members uh, and prospective members time and again over the past several years that it would be beneficial for Sightlines to be working closely with some of the larger cooperative purchasing services uh, in higher education. Um, we have finally been able to make that step and I'm pleased to announce that we are now working with both NJPA and ENI. That's allowing prospective members to hopefully have a more seamless procurement path to buying our services, um, both our ROPA Plus service, our, our benchmarking service, as well as our building portfolio solution, which is our uh, assessment and, and planning service, are now available to be purchased through both NJPA and ENI. Um, for most of you on the call as members, you've already uh, managed the procurement path, but we, we think this will be a benefit of course, to prospective members to make it easier for them, but of, of course also as, as we make it easier for prospective members, that hopefully means the membership grows, the data grows, um, and the peer institutions that you can compare against also grows. So we think this is a real benefit to everyone. Uh, worth mentioning that really the way that this all came about, the relationship that we have with NJPA and ENI, uh, happened as a result of the relationship that we now have with Gordian. Uh, so it serves as a, a good transition to talk a little bit about life as a part of the, the Gordian business. Um, as I mentioned before, it's been about nine months, um, and it's been a great nine months. Um, in many ways, we feel like we're getting the best of both worlds, meaning Sightlines remains the business you've grown to know and trust. Uh, you're still working with the same people. You're getting access to the same high-quality services and data. But at the same time, as part of a larger Gordian business, uh, Sightlines now has access to lots of new things that are enhancing our services and helping us to create new and exciting offerings. Um, so what I'll do now is just take a moment uh, to talk a little bit about Gordian at a high level. Uh, Gordian is the, the leading provider of construction data, software, and services that support really every phase of the construction life cycle, from planning to procurement all the way through operations and maintenance. Uh, Sightlines is really helping to fill a, a void in the Gordian portfolio because we are now serving as essentially the, the planning tools in that life cycle. You know our service as well. We're helping the institutions make better strategic decisions um, through the use of our data so that they're managing their buildings more effectively, their facility operations more effectively, our tool set and our capabilities are now being leveraged across the Gordian business. Um, but it's really going both ways. Uh, not only are we helping Gordian to fill uh, a void in their portfolio, but there are many aspects of the Gordian business that are enhancing the Sightlines business. And we're really just at the starting point of discovering all of those opportunities. But I think it's worth mentioning a few things that we're particularly excited about. 
The first is, uh, for those who don't know, RS Means is also a part of the Gordian business. RS Means was acquired by Gordian back in 2014. And RS Means is really the standard when it comes to cost estimation data um, for facilities. Sightlines now has access to what I consider to be a real treasure trove of data and analytics that we can tap into to use to enhance our existing services and also to really start to think up new and exciting and innovative services that we can begin to offer to our college and university clients. And just a, a specific way in which we're leveraging uh, RS means and working closely with them is in our building portfolio solutions service. So uh, that is our um, condition assessment and planning service uh, that many of you probably know. Um, with this service, we are now directly leveraging RS means uh, cost estimating data as we indicate the uh, costs associated with the projects that we are identifying through that assessment process. We're also now able to go a level deeper down to the component level when we are doing life cycle modeling, um, again, to help come up with those costs uh, over time for your facilities. And then lastly, and this is an exciting uh, new capability for us, it's not just the data that we're able to leverage from RS Means. Behind that great data are great certified engineers at RS Means. And as necessary, we're now able to deploy those engineers to work with us on projects um, when we are doing these assessments in the marketplace. Um, and so I'm sure you'll hear more about that as our folks talk to you about our broad abilities. But certainly this early work with RS Means is indicative of, of really great things to come as we collaborate not only with the RS Means folks, but with, uh, with the Gordian folks. On the specific point of this service, uh, this is a service where, for all intents and purposes, we are helping to lay out all of the projects that have been identified. We are then helping to prioritize those projects and building out a capital plan that ultimately allows the college or university to secure funding um, for the list of needs that's been identified. That has been our, our stopping point, if you will, as a business. Um, but certainly for the institution, that's really just the beginning of the process. There's much, much more work to come. And that really is around the execution of those projects. Um, and execution of those projects really begins with uh, procurement. And it's exciting for us to now be a part of the Gordian business where we can begin to talk beyond um, the plan and move into execution of capital projects. And, and certainly, we know that around the procurement and execution of, of construction projects, there are a number of challenges unique to higher ed. Um, your projects are, are never ending. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, the large projects, the new dorms, the stadiums, the parking garages. Um, but you're also dealing constantly with, with the smaller projects, um, the maintenance and repair projects. And traditionally, uh, competitive bidding for all projects is, is a very time-intensive, costly project uh, process for the institution. And particularly for those smaller projects, there's a disproportionate amount of time spent procurement. Additionally, higher ed is faced with the challenge of these projects happening in a very specific time of year. In fact, you're all living it right now, the summertime. And, and just the load of projects that you're trying to get done before kids are back on campus. Um, this creates lots of additional challenges for you as you're, as you're dealing with that time constraint. Of course, you're trying to make sure that you have sufficient project management resources. You're juggling those projects, making sure that they're completed on time and on budget. And you're also likely dealing with some constraints around qualified contractors as there's a rush to get this work done, not just by you, but other institutions in your area. And not just contractors, but contractors who really know um, higher ed and the work involved in making sure that um, construction projects happen the right way at an institution. These are all things that we know well, that Gordian knows well. And it's, um, it's great to now be able to hand it over to, to Scott, who's going to talk about Gordian's innovative approach to procurement around construction projects. 
we think that this is a real opportunity uh, within higher ed for there to be more streamlining and effectiveness in the way that capital projects, construction projects, are, are procured and ultimately executed. So I think um, we're going to run a quick survey before handing this over uh, to Scott. So if we could uh, run the survey, it's a quick two-question survey. So we'll get that going, and if you could all just respond when you see it. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Scott. Great. Thanks, Mark. Just, uh, thanks, everyone, for taking I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a few um, additional survey results coming in, so I'm just letting it finish up here. So let's give it a second. Super. Seems like everybody's had a chance to answer, so appreciate that. Um, no surprises there that the predominant use uh, delivery method is design, bid, build. Um, I think we've got a second question, Mark. Uh, if you could throw that up on the screen, I'd appreciate that. Just sure. to assess people's familiar, familiar with Jock, that'd be great. I think you should be able to, there we go. So real quick, if you could just take a moment to um, address that, that'd be great. Um, well, I'm glad that most folks don't have familiarity or have limited, um, because if you all were experts, then this would probably not be the best use of your time. So I will go ahead and take my allotted time and spend a few moments sharing with you a little bit, a little bit about job order contracting. Uh, I will not, uh, promise that I'm going to make you an expert today. I don't think that's appropriate, um, but absolutely I do expect we can get you enough baseline information that if you find something that's stimulated of interest that we can in fact um, share with you some other information offline. So uh, hopefully everybody can see the screen here, job order contracting defined. Let's see, there we go. So real quickly, what is job order contracting? Um, in short, job order contracting is a form of an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract from IDIQ, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. IDIQs go back decades. Uh, it originally started out as a form of uh, contracting for commodity purchases. JOC itself was created as an IDIQ contracting model to help facility and infrastructure owners complete a large number of repair, maintenance, renovation, and straightforward new construction projects with a single competitively bid contract. Unlike traditional bidding where each project is identified, has to be designed, and then put out to bid, job order contracting or JOC establishes competitively bid prices at the construction task level up front and eliminates the need to separately bid each project. Uh, as Mark alluded to earlier, this allows colleges and universities the ability to accomplish a substantial number of individual projects with a single bid, uh, from renovations, emergency repairs, retrofit projects, and even some limited scope new construction, all can be completed under one job order contract. Um, job order contracting makes available contractors that are ready to perform numerous projects with competitively bid preset prices. A lot of your projects, as Mark alluded to, take place during breaks, so having these on-call contractors can really help get your project started faster. This is also key, obviously, for emergency projects, regardless of whether the student's on campus or not. I think what's really unique about job order contracting is that it is a fundamentally different relationship between the owner and the contractor. Job order contracting, by the nature of the contractual vehicle and how it's bid and awarded, fosters a far more collaborative engagement between the owner and the contractor. Because the contractor has already been awarded the competitively bid IDIQ agreement, the owner and contractor don't have to operate at arm's length from one another 
in the midst of establishing and executing through the construction project. They are free to collaborate on the scope and discuss value engineering options to optimize outcomes before the first state of dirt is every turn, uh, ever turned. Um, it really helps to change the motivational behavior for a lot of those contractors as well. Um, because the awarded master agreement has no minimum value, only a maximum potential, contractors are incentivized to perform the best work possible because the real reward of, of winning a job or a contract is not the one project you get today, but it's the maximum value of that contract over the one or two or three year term plus any option years that the owner has established with a capacity. So contractors are inherently incented to do the best they can, perform on schedule, under budget, because they really want to attract that subsequent follow-on work. That makes the optimal value of the contract realized for them. So at the core of a JOC program is what we call a pre-established set of construction prices. Uh, Gordian refers to its unit price catalog as construction task catalog. These prices are the all-in cost, inclusive of material, labor, and equipment for a discrete construction task and a specified unit of measure. Think about pulling a linear foot of uh, fiber optic cable or hanging a square foot of drywall. These JOT contracts are solicited uh, by having contractors bid what is called an adjustment factor or a coefficient to these preset task prices. Essentially, a contractor is proposing a markup to the catalog cost that is inclusive of their overhead and profit. The owner then awards the master agreement in accordance with his procurement code. That might be the, to the lowest responsive responsible bidder, or it could be based on best value criteria if your procurement legislation so authorizes you. Upon award, the owner can execute any number of projects or job orders up to the aggregate value of the master agreement without having to bid them out individually. Uh, the price for each project is a simple mathematical calculation. The sum of the individual tasks necessary to satisfy the scope you've defined times the quantity of those tasks times the contractor's coefficient. We at Gordian believe there are three essential components to a, to a successful JOC program. The first is the data, which we've spoken about a bit already. Um, the important thing is that this data, those construction task prices that I spoke about, are specific to the owner and localized to the unique geographic market. It does you no good to have a cost basis if you're operating in the state of uh, state of Texas and the city of Houston for a set construction price that is not localized and specific to that market. Um, to give you a sense of the scope of the data I'm talking about, Gordian's construction task catalog includes over 275,000 tasks, more than 180 labor categories, 2,900 plus equipment types, and over 240,000 material items, each with an accompanying technical specification and a highly localized price to the owner's specific market. The second component is a robust software application. This is essential to providing the owner and contractor a collaborative work, workflow platform that drives the job order contracting process. We provide to our clients a platform called eGordian. It's a highly configurable, full-function SaaS application that manages end-to-end -end job processes. It houses the electronic version of the construction task catalog, all those prices we spoke about, and includes such functions as job order proposal generation, collaborative platform for proposal review and approval between the owner and the contractor, resource tracking, and some pretty robust management reporting. Whatever solution you may decide to use to power your JOC program, the important thing is you want to make sure that it includes a tool that provides a comprehensive audit trail should the auditors ever come knocking. Finally, a successful JOC program requires a level of expertise across a number of disciplines, some of which you would likely have in-house and some of which you won't. Um, as an example, my guess is you aren't staffed to conduct the 22,000 plus hours of cost research we perform annually that we use to build and maintain the cost data. And if you've never implemented a JOC program, which it looks like from the survey here, a lot of you folks don't have that experience, you may need some outside assistance to get the proper bid docs in place and to document the business processes. But I do expect you all have project managers that can manage the actual execution of projects, though you may need additional support during those peak construction periods. The bottom line is there are implementation and operational support resources available to you to match the needs, whatever they may be, to implement and make successful job order contracting program. 
So I've talked a little bit about what contracting is. Let me segue into what facility owners are saying about job order contracting. Recently, the performance-based studies research group at Arizona State University published the results of a year-long study of job order contracting performance. Um, this study led by Dr. Dean Kashiwagi, who is a professor at ASU's Dell E. Webb School of Construction, gathered over 3,000 data points across more than $5 billion of construction survey. Um, I'd like to note that over 25% of the, of the participating owners in that study were from higher education. Um, what you'll see on the screen before you is some of those key findings. A 99% recommendation rate from facility owners to use JOC, estimated administrative cost savings of 24%, schedule and budget performance that comparatively outperformed design bid builds and design build delivery methods by 7 to 10% range. What you all won't see on the screen here is uh, what I found was one of the marquee findings of the study was that overall satisfaction is rated by owners with job order contracting exceeded that of satisfaction of design bid build by nearly 20, 20 percentage points from the owner surveyed. Um, that's a uh, full report. I think in its uh, full 75 or 78 pages of glory is available on Gordian's website, although uh, certainly submit us an email at the end of this webinar if you'd like. We'll be happy to put a full copy of that report in your hands. As far as the benefits of job order contracting, um, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper on what the research findings show. I would generally characterize the benefits of job order contracting in four categories. Time savings, transparency and governance, increased supplier participation, and cost savings. In a second independent research different from the ASU study, um, there was over a billion dollars of construction surveyed. And as a result of that study, owners reported they were able to improve the procurement cycle by 40 to 50 percent versus traditional procurement methods when using JOC. Um, long and short of it is the elimination of the repetitive procurement tasks with having to bid each and every project, regardless of its size and scope, can be eliminated through the award of one competitively bid IDIQ contract. Um, I can attest to the fact that our long-term uh, long clients cite many advantages of time savings, and honestly, many cite time savings as the primary benefit of job order contracting. Certainly in the higher ed environment, JOC enables the expedited procurement necessary to execute programs during those limited academic breaks where most of your work is taking place. You'll see on the screen here two specific examples with some pretty compelling metrics. Um, the second one there, at SUNY Binghamton, the university documented 108-day savings in the total construction timeline, all of that taken out of the procurement cycle itself for a cooling tower replacement project as a direct result of using job order contracting. Um, meanwhile, that first bullet, uh, in one of the most robust independent audits ever performed on the JOC program, the Los Angeles Unified School District demonstrated an average procurement time savings of 190 days and that was measured over the lifespan of a program that had 3,000 projects. Secondly, I wanted to speak a little bit about transparency and governance. The collaborative nature of the relationship between owner and contractor fosters an improved level of transparency, which ultimately translates to a higher level of process governance. We all know, um, and certainly those of you in the public sector, the public higher education, uh, that governance and transparency is critical to your success in your role. Um, as you see here, ASU's performance-based studies research group reported that owners see a level of process transparency nearly double that of the design, bid, build, and design, build, delivery methodologies. Um, it's pretty simple. It's the ability for the contractor and owner to not have to operate at arm's length during the process of defining the scope and then defining the price that opens up that level of transparency for both parties. Improving supplier, supplier participation, whether it be local, small, minority, women, or service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, is of ever-increasing importance to facility owners. Um, you'll see here on this screen two pretty compelling examples. These are measured over significant levels of construction spend at two very large public agencies. Uh, these indicate that job order contracting can dramatically increase the level of supplier participation over target levels. Again, both of these in excess of $600 million over the life of the program that these agencies conducted these internal audits.
and let's face it, cost matters. So I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on how the research illustrates the potential for cost savings from the job order contracting program. In an independent study conducted by Holden Advisors distilled their research into five areas of cost savings. And I want to touch on each of those very briefly here. Um, regardless of the scope of the project, the design, bid, build methodology requires a full set of stamp drawings. So for the scope of projects normally addressed by JOC, these renovation projects replace in kind types of repairs, that full set of design is often overkill. Uh, many of our owners uh, jokingly say that they often design to buy and don't design to build because of the burden of the procurement process. So owners have reported that using JOC, they can eliminate as much as 80% of the design costs. Um, the reality of it is because you're not operating at arm's length from the contractor, they have an obligation to provide the necessary design work to pull permits and get the work done itself. It doesn't uh, relinquish you from the obligation of doing full design where required, certainly life safety issues, but the superfluous um, design work that may, be, may really not be required to renovate uh, the bathroom in the first floor of the administrative building can be eliminated from the, uh, from the overall cost of the project. Uh, as it relates to procurement costs, that second uh, row there on the table, the bid once by many nature of an IDIQ JOC, IDIQ JOC contract eliminates the procurement burden on owners, showing procurement administrative savings in the range of 40 to 50 percent. Um, thirdly, direct, cost, direct construction costs are positively impacted because the detailed task level nature of JOC proposals affords owners the ability to scrutinize project proposal costs uh, for, superfluous, for superfluous items. Whether review the proposals in-house or use a third-party assistance, uh, thorough review of contract proposals can yield significant hard dollar savings. You'll see here anywhere from 3 to 35 percent based upon the size and scope of the project. Uh, next on the list there is post-award costs, and that's really all about reducing the costs associated with change orders. Uh, industry data shows that 8 to 14 percent of the cost of any job is in changes. Uh, I'm not going to profess that the use of job order contracting necessarily reduces the frequency of changes. You are inevitably going to have unforeseen conditions or owner-directed changes of scope after you start the project. But because any change to the original scope of work is priced out of the construction task catalog, those preset unit prices, the owner retains control of the price. Uh, there's a great quote from one of our customers who says that for every increase in change, increase uh, scope as a result of a change, I'm paying twice of the value, but for any reduction of scope, I'm only getting 50 cents on the dollar back. Because you're operating changes under a preset cost basis model times that coefficient or adjustment factor, you now have complete transparency and control of those costs. And then finally, the backlog reduction, um, pretty simple. Costs go up over time, uh, and every year that deferred maintenance doesn't get executed, inflationary costs of construction, of labor, of materials, compound the overall cost of the institution. So the ability to take procurement time out of the cycle to execute more projects in a timely fashion has a direct impact on hard dollar savings. Responses from the owners uh, solicited in this survey, which has covered a billion dollars of construction, range from 1.7 to 5 percent based upon their anticipated economic forecast of inflationary costs for their institution. So real quickly, I want to take just a couple of minutes, um, show you two or three specific real-life examples, case studies of institutions that are doing job order contracting um, with some level of assistance from the Gordian Group. Uh, first up here, a very large public institution, California State University. Um, California State University since 1999 has had a centrally managed job order contracting program that spans the breadth of all 23 campuses. And as you can imagine, there is a quite a, uh, quite a variety of facility and infrastructure needs as well as the facility staff to support those needs amongst these varying sizes and scopes of campuses. Um, over the lifetime of the program, there's over $300 million completed work. And ultimately, the benefit that CSU sees from the Chancellor's Office is a centrally managed, standardized program to expedite construction across the diverse campuses. Um, where necessary, unique construction task catalogs have been built to the technical specifications to match the campus needs, and all of those costs have been 
uh, defined locally and bid locally to provide local contractors the opportunity to compete and win that business to support the Cal State system. Next on the list, um, another institution from the West Coast, Stanford. Really two main reasons that Stanford implemented the job order contracting program. One was to eliminate or limit the amount of very small unit price contracts that they issued annually. There was preponderance of very small valued contracts which creates an administrative overhead burden on institution to manage over time. And then secondly was to provide some cost control over the projects since there was a growing perception within the institution that the familiarity with the contracting base that was doing so much work, um, simply put, was beginning to take a little bit of advantage of the university. Um, they called it the Stanford factor for pricing, that because there was such a sense of familiarity that prices over time were creeping up. It's interesting that the RS Means out of our house does a fair amount of predictive analytics work um, where they can look at institutions that have multiple locations across vast geographies or single institutions over time and see the impact of price increase over time by using the same contractors over and over again, which is a little bit inverse to what you expect. You would think that familiarity would drive costs down, uh, but actually many of the data points uh, point to the opposite. And then lastly, let me um, speak to Georgetown University. Georgetown is a relatively new user of JOC, um, brought in by their chief facilities officer who had uh, was familiar with JOC in the public sector. Uh, a vast different demand across the university, the medical center, different schools, teachers, researchers, um, et cetera, a lot of different stakeholders. Job order contracting for Georgetown provides the detailed breakdowns of the requested scopes so that these clients clearly understand the details and costs of their project requests. Um, ultimately, the collaborative nature between contractor and owner allows the project team to scope projects immediately, discuss con uh, construction schedules, and very importantly, because of the, um, so the challenges with the historic buildings, et cetera, at Georgetown to deal with the long lead time items uh, and the special conditions and restraints of the project itself. Um, again, relatively new program only has been live uh, for the past uh, 12 to 18 months. So we'll distribute this entire deck as Mark alludes to after the fact. There are a few more case studies buried uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, but to afford people the opportunity to ask a few questions, uh, Eric, I will go ahead and uh, Eric and Mark will turn this back over to you folks. Uh, if there's any questions that come in that we can field from the audience. Yeah, Scott, there, there are a couple, um, and I'll, I'll throw them to you. Uh, so the first is, is a question, uh, how does a time and material contract differ from job order contracting? Um, that's a fair question. I talked a lot about the nature of JOC being based upon preset unit prices, uh, as very much so time and materials contracts are. The fundamental difference is that uh, a job order contracting construction task bakes in the labor, so the time, the materials, and the equipment all into a defined task. Um, to give you a specific example, if you want a contractor to come in, take out uh, an old door, replace the hardware, hang a new door, a time and materials contract will define the material itself at a set price, but the time is only set at an hourly rate. So whether that contractor takes two hours or 12 hours, the price is completely dependent on the number of hours devoted to the job. Under job order contracting, the task of demoing the existing door, installing new hardware, and hanging the new door are defined based upon crew sizes and productivity measures. So that price defines what the standard productivity and ultimate cost should be. So whether that contractor takes two hours or 12 hours to complete that task, it is the price in the job order contracting catalog that will define the ultimate price to the owner. It's not dependent upon the productivity and the time spent under the time and materials contract. Scott, we received a couple of questions that are similar in nature. I'll, I'll try to consolidate. Um, it's really around, uh, is there a type or size of project best suited for JOC? Uh, similarly, is there a minimum project spend below which uh, a JOC program really doesn't benefit? Um, 
I think really that the sweet spot for a project delivered by job of a contract is less about the size and more about the scope. Um, I mean, certainly there are projects that are below a certain size and scope that you're not going to get the return. And what I would generally say is projects below your bid threshold, you probably aren't going to see the benefit from job order contracting. Um, likewise, you're not going to go out and build a $100 million capital construction project using job order contracting. It's um, impractical to expect that you would build a line item proposal out of the task catalog of all the things that compose a $100 million capital construction project. But I would say that sweet spot is really between that $50,000 and maybe two or $3 million project range. Um, but as I said, it's more about the scope of the project, the types of tasks. Job order contracting does extremely well in multi-trade types of projects. Um, if you have a lot of single trade types projects, um, job order contract would be effective, but in doing so, you really want to implement a single trade or a specialty jock program as opposed to a general contractor led jock program because there's no need to pay a GCV overhead. So the way you construct the program, um, the actual contracts you bid, maps very well to the nature of the projects. But again, uh, the nature or the dollar size of the project is probably less important than the nature of the scope and the types of trades and tasks included. Um, the second part, Mark, you asked, is there a level where a JOC program doesn't make sense? Um, there is an administrative burden of implementing a JOC program like anything else. You have to go through that first competitive bid to get the program set up. Uh, I'm not sure it's worth it if you are going to be doing you know, less than two or three or four million dollars in JOC spend a year across your institution. That being said, I will tell you that um, Gordian has partnered with the same cooperative organizations that Mark alluded to. National Joint Powers Alliance and ENI, and we put in cooperative job order contracting programs. So we actually have regional turnkey JOC programs in place in different geographies. So an institution that may not have necessary level to warrant implementing their own program, or perhaps just wants to pilot job order contract to see if it's effective, can leverage one of those cooperative contracts where they're already um, competitively awarded job order contracting contractors in place standing by to do work at locally priced catalogs. So I'll, I'll combine two questions again. Uh, it's, it's really about um, what's uh, the staff expectations for administering a job program and then ultimately how long is it taking to, to set up and implement a job program? So JOC programs can be fit to any institution regardless of their ability to support it with internal staff. Um, like about any other service you can get in the business server, service world anymore, you can outsource any or all or none of any of those functions for which you may not be staffed organically to handle. Um, so I'll tell you, we have customers where we help them implement the program and set up and train them, and we leave them uh, and their staff to run that program in perpetuity themselves, and they execute extremely well. We have other customers who don't have the bandwidth staff capacity, so we may actually have account managers, project managers, who are seconded to those facilities and institutions and stay there full time, where we might do the full gamut of construction management. We, we walk jobs, we develop scopes, we manage the construction through to completion. Um, we have a dedicated implementation team. If you were to say to Gordian, we want to help set up a program. Um, we have resources that can help you go through the bid process itself and to teach you how to get that done uh, and then allow your staff to execute and maintain that in, uh, organically going forward. So I think it really varies, but there's certainly a level of service that can be matched to any level of organic staffing to make it successful. Um, as far as timed implementation, um, you have to go through that first bid process that one time. So if it normally takes you four months to bid a single construction project under traditional design, bid, build procurement cycle, that's probably what it's going to take you to go through that cycle of bidding the construction contracts that are awarded to the JOC contractors. So there's no secret sauce about JOC that eliminates that burden of procurement to establish the program. But the benefit comes after you establish that program you're executing task orders or job orders without having to go through the procurement cycle. I will tell you candidly, normally um, 
the barriers to the speed of implementation um, are not folks like Gordian that build the data catalog and implement the software. Those things can take very rapidly. Uh, the barrier to the speed of implementation is typically the institution. The reality is you have a day job. Um, so I would say the pace at which the job or contract or program can be implemented is really governed by how many resources and how much of a priority the institution can make it to get those construction contracts awarded. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, that's sure. it for for questions. Um, so appreciate uh, Scott all your uh, responses, and uh, appreciate everyone's time this afternoon for joining our webinar. Um, as, as we stated earlier, all this material will be sent out to you and the webinar recording will be posted online uh, so that you can have access to it. Again, thank you for your time and have a terrific day.